Mordecai Ritzler, Canada's famed novelist, humorist, short story writer, essayist, critic, and scriptwriter, has built his reputation on such works as The Apprenticeship of Dudley Kravitz, Saint Bobain's Horseman, Talk Show, The Street, Shoveling Trouble, and other novels and essay collections. Born in Montreal, he has returned there to live after 20 years expatriate residence in England. His first book for children, full of satirical wit, gentle humor, and compassion, is dedicated to his own five children. Once there was a boy called Jacob Tutu. He was two plus two plus two years old. He had two ears and two eyes and two arms and two feet and two shoes. He also had two older sisters, Emma and Martha, and two older brothers, Daniel and Noah. And they all lived in a rambling old house on Kingston Hill in England. Most days, Jacob Tutu was happy. But other days, bad days, he was very sad. On bad days, he saw that all the other children in the house were taller and much more capable than he was. His two older brothers, and even his two older sisters, could ride two-wheeled bicycles, dial a telephone number, whistle, play checkers, and catch a ball. Mind you, life was becoming more tolerable. Once, Jacob Tutu couldn't even reach the front doorbell. Only two years ago, when he was a mere two times two years old, Jacob Tutu didn't even know what a day was, where yesterday had gone, and when tomorrow would come. Waking up one morning, he had asked his mother, Is this tomorrow? Is this tomorrow? No, darling, it's today. But when you tucked me in at night, you said when I got up, this day would be tomorrow. You promised. You promised. That was yesterday. You said it was today. It was. And then this was going to be tomorrow. But you just said this day is today, too. You just said, oh, Jacob, his mother had said, kissing him. Sometimes you're too much. Even though he was now two plus two plus two years old and knew more, plenty more, Jacob Tutu was still not allowed to count sheets for the laundry or cross the street by himself. Neither could he run errands for his mummy and daddy, like his older brothers and sisters. He could now pour milk into his cereal bowl without spilling some, but he still couldn't cut a slice of bread that wasn't a foot thick on one end and thin as a sheet of paper on the other. True, he was now allowed to sit in a big chair at the kitchen table, but what good was it when he could hardly see over his dinner plate and his feet didn't touch the floor but dangled foolishly? And if he lost his temper over this or other injustices and threw a punch at Daniel or Emma, they didn't even holler a hit back. They merely giggled. One day, when everybody in the house had something absorbing to do, Jacob Tutu wandered into his big brother's bedroom. Out, shouted Daniel. I'm doing my homework. His sister Martha was curled up on the sofa in the study watching wrestling on television. You can't stay in here, she said. Why? asked Jacob Tutu. Why? Because the wrestlers are doing scary things, and you're still a baby, and it will give you nightmares, and you'll wet your bed. I won't, said Jacob Tutu, I won't. Look, said Martha, pointing at the wrestler on the screen. That's the hooded fang, and he's going to jump out of the TV set any minute and chew you to bits. I'm not frightened, said Jacob Tutu, retreating. In the garden, under the shelter of the copper beech tree, he found his brother Noah and his sister Emma were at it again. Dressed up, disguised, they were playing their game of pretend. Noah was dangling from the tree, 
He had a plastic dagger between his teeth and a big towel draped over his shoulders like a cape. Okay, Shapiro, he shouted. Come out and fight. Emma raced out of her tent, waving a wooden sword. Say your prayers, O'Toole, she snarled, because here I come. As Noah swung to the ground and Emma charged, Jacob Tutu jumped between them. Can I play? he asked. Can I play? Oh no, moaned Noah. Now you've gone and spoiled everything. Then I'll be on your side, said Jacob Tutu to his sister. I'll help you. I'll help you. Oh, Jacob, she said. You're too little to help anybody. Our game's too complicated for you. I want to play, said Jacob Tutu. I want to play. Hey, said Noah, pointing at the kitchen window. Listen, Mummy's calling you. Jacob Tutu found his mother in the kitchen. Did you call me, he asked. Did you call me? No, dear. Jacob Tutu didn't ask if he could help cook the dinner. He knew his mother would smile and say he was too little, just as he was too little to go to a real school, like the one his brothers went to. And more than anything, Jacob Tutu longed to go to a real school. Even though Noah had warned him, they had punishment cells there, dark and gloomy, with double locked doors, and the naughty boys ultimately had to appear before a judge. At a real school, Noah had also said, good boys were served chips with red wine for lunch, followed up by ice cream and cigars. Now you run off and play, said Jacob Tutu's mother. I'll call you when dinner's ready. His brothers and sisters didn't want him. His mother didn't need him. So Jacob Tutu went to find his father. He was lying on the living room sofa reading the newspaper. I want to run an errand, said Jacob Tutu. I want to run an errand. You're still too small, said his father. No, I'm not. I'm not, said Jacob Tutu. And suddenly he burst into tears. All right, then. His father dug into his pocket for some coins. Go to Mr. Cooper, the green grocer, two doors down the street, and get me two pounds of firm red tomatoes. <clears throat> Jacob Tutu ran off, just a little frightened, because this was his first errand, and Emma had warned him that Mr. Cooper, the green grocer, was two-faced. He was nice to children as long as their parents were with them. He pinched the cheeks and offered them grapes. But if a child came into his shop alone, he made them wait until all the big people had been served. Emma said Mr. Cooper was sour as a lemon. Jacob Tutu clutched his coins as he entered Mr. Cooper's shop. He saw that the green grocer was pear-shaped his brown hair cut short, like a coconut. His eyes were small as orange seeds, but his ears big as cauliflower leaves. His nose was red and veined as a beet, and his stomach stuck out like a sack of potatoes. What do you want? asked Mr. Cooper. I want two pounds of firm red tomatoes. I want two pounds of firm red tomatoes. Mr. Cooper frowned. He was insulted, for he had no way of knowing that Jacob Tutu said everything two times, because what with so many people in his house, two parents, two older brothers, and two older sisters, nobody ever heard him the first time. There's no need to chew your cabbage twice in here, said Mr. Cooper. But I'm Jacob Tutu. I'm two plus two plus two years old. And if you please, I want two pounds of firm red tomatoes. Two pounds of firm red tomatoes. You stop making fun of me, said Mr. Cooper, winking at his other customers, all of them big people. Or I'll call the police. 
and just then Mr. Cupid did in fact see the policeman passing on his rounds and summoned him inside. What is it, Mr. Cooper? asked the policeman. I'm being mocked, said Mr. Cooper. All the big people in the shop laughed. By this one, the green grocer added, pointing a finger as long as a carrot at Jacob Tutu. The policeman looked down at Jacob Tutu. What is it, boy? Terrified, Jacob Tutu replied, All I want, if you please, is two pounds of firm red tomatoes. All I want is two pounds of firm red tomatoes. Mr. Cooper stamped his foot. He beat his fist against his forehead. I demand justice. This exacerbating little boy, he insisted, must be charged with insulting behavior to a big person. The policeman, holding back his laughter, took a step towards Jacob Tutu. But Jacob Tutu, his heart thumping, ducked and flew out of the shop. Hey! Mr. Cooper called after him. Come back here! We were only teasing you. Jacob Tutu had already cleared the corner and was racing down the hill and into Richmond Park, flying past the high iron gates that were shut after dark, like prison bars. He ran and ran, avoiding the pond which Martha had warned him was full of crocodiles and snakes. He ran with his head down, keeping a sharp eye out for poisonous snakes, a threat which Noah protected him against for only a penny a week. Finally, he sank to the grass, out of breath. Only then did he notice the fog beginning to settle, closing in on him, shivering just a little. Jacob Tutu rubbed his eyes. <laughs>